For more on this news, let's bring in the aforementioned Rich Greenfield, media and technology analyst at Lightshed Partners. Rich, great to have you with us. What's your Thanks take on me, this? Melissa. And does this make you, you have a sale rating on Disney. Does this make you more optimistic about Disney's prospects? Look, this is a brilliant move in terms of in terms of first steps, right? Like Disney had to figure out how they decided who made decisions. You know, when you're making lots of content, the, the real challenge right now is does this go to a cable network? Does this go to the movie theaters? Does this go to Disney Plus? Like there was all of this internal debate over which content went where, because unlike Netflix, which obviously only has one place to put it or an Amazon Prime where there's one place to put it with Disney, there's probably 20 different places for content to go. And so step one obviously is, are you actually putting and prioritizing this content and putting it in the place that creates the most value? I think this is essentially what this new reorg is designed to do is basically, hey, we need to have a core team that all they're going to focus on is which content we make for which platform. The reality, though, in terms of like what is going to mean for the stock is what are their actions actually going to be? Because, you know, they had this big opportunity. They had a whole list of movies that were ready to go to streaming and could have gone to streaming in Q4. They've delayed all of those movies other than Soul, which is behind me. That's going to go to Disney Plus on Christmas Day. But the entire rest of the slate has been delayed until middle of next year. And so they still seem pretty committed to the movie theater business and to kind of windowing content. And so mm -hmm. it's great that they're reorging. I applaud it. I think it's absolutely the right move. Now we need to see when they say, and I heard Chapik, when they say they're going to be more aggressive, let's actually see them do it. You know, they've done this with Hamilton, now with Soul. Are they prepared to start shifting their highest profile properties, Lucasfilms, Marvel Films, directly to D to C? We haven't seen any evidence of that. I think that's what the market is really looking for, is are they ready to sort of embrace being Netflix? Hey, Rich, it's Tim. Thanks for joining us. And, and that's where I would like to go with the question is on the multiple, because it's all about the Netflix multiple. And does anything that's announced today change the multiple? When they went to DTC, I felt like a more hybrid multiple was 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 imperative. But um, you're the man. You tell us yeah, how like, you're going to look at this. Tim, now. I think you got to really think about sort of, you know, this is not just about subscribers. Remember, you know, Disney Plus has lots of subscribers, you know, 60 plus million subscribers. But remember, the ARPU is a fraction of what Netflix gets. And the reason why is that we did a study, we looked at a recent study that Comscore put out. Disney is roughly 5% of streaming time spent in the US. Netflix is 26, 27%. And so it's not just about, you know, it's not just about having um, a lot of subscribers, it's about how much are they actually using it. Disney Plus, because there hasn't been yep. that much fresh content, hasn't gotten used a lot, especially over the age of 10 consumers. And so I think what it comes back to is really the first question in terms of the valuation for their D2C business is premised on, do they actually treat it like Netflix? Netflix doesn't put movies in movie theaters for you know, 65, 70 days and then try to put them on D2C. They use, subscribe, they use content directly into, into the streaming service to drive the ARPU, to drive the new subscribers. And so you mentioned before, I think it was, maybe it was Julia, that they raised price last year. They raised price on Netflix last year because they've added more value. They just raised price in Canada last week, Australia a few weeks ago. So it, the bulk of content, the, the, the huge amount of content on Netflix has allowed them not just to drive subs, but to drive pricing. And that obviously drives the valuation that you would attribute to a D2C platform. I think for Disney, we have to move from this being something that you charge, you know, essentially the average ARPU of Disney Plus is around $5. How do we get that to be a meaningful ARPU, meaning seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve dollars $12? Moving original films like Soul, if they are consistently willing to do that, I think that's a service that could drive a $15 plus dollar ARPU and completely change the future of the Walt Disney Company. Hopefully we'll get a sense on December 10th whether that's the direction they're going and how wedded they are towards the movie theaters and kind of that sequential release pattern that has dictated the movie business for the last 30, 40 years. So, so Rich, when you said before that now basically a, a centralized uh, place within the Walt Disney Company will decide where to put that content in order to drive the most value, how is value perceived in that respect? I mean, you can, you can perceive value by putting a blockbuster film onto Disney Plus and gaining a certain number, X number of, of subs, or saying that gaining X number of subs will let it have an, a, a third of the valuation of a Netflix, and so therefore that creates value. How do you think they're going to navigate that? Well, Netflix, you know, we did a study recently that showed that Netflix uh, revenues are now greater than Disney studio revenues. And, 
you know, if you actually add, you know, Netflix is going to be larger than Disney and Warner Brothers film studios together. And so the economics of streaming, um, you know, having hundreds of millions of subscribers at, you know, 10 plus dollars a month, it, it's a massive business, far better than any historical studio business. And so I, I would argue the right long term decision is to move content off of those legacy platforms like new shows. I don't know why Dancing with the Stars premieres on ABC. I would put Dancing with the Stars on streaming. I don't know why, you know, a movie like Black Widow has to get punted to next year. I'd put it, you know, yes. Is there tremendous short term economics? There are. But if you really believe in your assets and the quality of your content and you believe you can build a long term subscription business, I think Netflix and Spotify and you can go you know, down the list. I mean, look at Peloton in the last. If you, if you really believe you can build a scaled subscription business, the rewards are, are incredible. And so I would think if Disney's looking at this, what investors are hoping for is that Disney really lives up to what they say, meaning it's not just putting the people in these divisions and reorganizing, that it's actually going to lead to a different approach to content and that they actually are going to say, you know what, we're going to start starving these cable networks. We're going to start starving the broadcast network. We're going to put this stuff first onto streaming mm -hmm. because that's where we build the long-term asset value. I don't know if they're ready to do it. I think right. it's going to be really interesting to see whether what happened in Q4 with shifting movies, they take a very different approach yeah. as they move into next year because of this structure. Well, that'd be a very different business model from what it is currently. Rich, great to have you with us. Thank you, Thanks Rich Greenfield, me. Lightshed Partners. Um, and Guy, I'll go back to you since we've got you back, uh, hopefully technical Sorry. issue free. Um, but this would be a, that would be a major change. So let's let's say that what Rich Greenfield is prescribing happens and that Disney becomes that content juggernaut focused on streaming. What does that do to its other parts of its businesses? I mean, obviously, networks would be starved, cable channels would be starved of content, but how about parks and, and crews and things like that? I don't think they're going to take their focus away. I, listen, I, hopefully parks come back as, you know, they all go hand in hand, parks, crews, movies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think that's still a big part of their business, but my point earlier was, and I don't know how far I got, I think this was in response to the success Netflix had over the last decade. And I think that's exactly it. If Disney can be even remotely as successful as, as mm -hmm. Netflix and get sort of a third of the valuation, then you're talking about a much different multiple for this stock. And I think that's the game plan here. You know, what they do with ESPN is really beside the point. In terms of levels, and I know Tim can speak to this, 136 was the high I think we saw on August 28th. That's where we're probably going to trade up to. A close above that, and then you have the all-time high of 153 from November right in the crosshairs. It's interesting how the calendar works out on that one. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.